if something is owned, then by definition, there is something external to it that is doing the owning. Likewise, something that is owned is by definition something external to the agent that owns it. Taking this very basic point into account, does it really make that much sense to think in terms of self-ownership? For if the self is something that is owned, then it is being owned by something or someone else. So then what is this entity that owns us and yet is us at the same time? Surely if it owns us, then it is not us. Or if we own the thing in question, then it is not us. In short, we run into the problem of creating a metaphysical duality in which the self is split into an essential and unessential self, or a dominant and passive self, in which the body is merely something that is inhabited by a soul or spirit. One way of trying to get out of this problem would be to sever this duality into two separate entities, although of course the problem of explaining the existence and nature of this immaterial soul or spirit would remain. Another way of getting out of this problem would be to disregard the soul or spirit as a floating abstraction, and to consequentially recognize the actual self as a coherent whole, devoid of any dominating metaphysical entity. The idea of an external metaphysical entity that owns oneself renders the individual into nothing more than the slave of an abstraction, for their actual material being is placed into a submissive position in relation to this metaphysical entity, or this particular manifestation of it. Individual autonomy and self-realization can actually be said to come under threat as a result of such a concept. In reality, this abstract metaphysical self functions as a false identity, and implies some sort of internal struggle. Such an internal struggle can only be avoided by casting out or denying such a metaphysical duality to begin with, at which point the actual self can be meaningfully recognized and rights can be meaningfully derived. None of this is being said to belittle the importance of individual sovereignty, but rather it is being said to save it from internal disin disintegration while avoiding the problem of solipsism at the same time. This is a rather simple matter of recognizing the distinction between one's actual self and that which is either external to oneself or non-existent to begin with. If such a distinction is not made, then there will forevermore be a confusing haze with respect to discussions about rights and their proper derivation.